We're looking forward to an amazing uh, symposium to hear what you're doing here, to show you a little bit of what we do there, and really looking forward to establish a very long lasting collaboration. So I will be presenting soon uh, Tel Aviv University to you, but this is in short what we are here doing and what we are uh, bringing to this symposium today. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Dr. Elias Campos. Okay, thank you, uh, Campos. Um, Welcome. I think it's a privilege uh, to have you here. Uh, I am a pathologist uh, and now the director of this research institute that I think uh, has the privilege, as you see, to be just across the street of uh, one of the major hospitals in Spain and, and reference center for many diseases. This center, as you will see, I will present, was created now 25 years ago uh, to bring uh, translational basic research to a hospital that already had uh, a strong uh, and long uh, history of clinical. It was uh, understood at that time that it was important to bring uh, basic research uh, close to a hospital and that's why this institute was created and obviously without the help of uh, Mr. Sergopolovic uh, we will not have this building and with this building we don't have a space and with a the space there is, although you have ideas, there is no way to, to, to bring it to reality. So I think that uh, we will present a little bit more our activity, but uh, this is our campus and it's, uh, we, we think that uh, science advances thanks to collaborations and international collaborations are opening uh, new windows that uh, it's important to explore and I think we have to take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campo. Thank you very much, Elias. Dr. Tony Trilla, the Dean of the University, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, shalom, bon dia, good morning. Uh, my name is Antoni Trilla. I was trained as an infectious disease physician and currently work as an epidemiology on infectious disease. This is the main reason because they try to put me uh, as dean of the medical school because they know that a pandemic will come <laughs> and then they will say we better have someone who doesn't uh, uh, move very much when there is a, a, a health crisis. Anyway, welcome to Barcelona. I think that both universities have a long standing tradition of uh, trying to gather research, uh, assistance or healthcare and teaching that are the main goals for our both institutions. And I, I'm fully uh, confident that the, the day today and tomorrow will be a very fruitful days for all. And probably as uh, a, a, a phrase that has been said many times, this should be the beginning of a long standing friendship, I think, and collaboration. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trilla, Dr. Campo, Dr. Friedman. And I think now it's trying to introduce a little bit with a little bit more detail the two campus, uh, Campus Clinic, uh, Clinic Campus and the University of Tel Aviv. And maybe you have some uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how it works. Uh, Neil, come put your hand. Brief, but will be brief. A presentation about the campus. I uh, have the three topics, but uh, Dr. Elias Campo will talk about research, and Dr. Trilla will talk about education. And then I introduce the campus. That's where we are. As you know, it's a little bit crowded city. Tel Aviv is also crowded. Jerusalem is probably more crowded, but Barcelona is also crowded, and we are really in the downtown. It's a privilege to live and to work in the downtown because there are many advantages, but also there is a very important problem, as uh, Elias mentioned, about the space. And the space is very limited, as you can see here, because there are many buildings and there are many constructions, and it's difficult, really, uh, to grow. That's hospital clinic. As you can see, we are approximately here. And that's our uh, outpatient department, and that's uh, the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Barcelona. And the important thing here, as I mentioned, it's a campus. It's a campus with a clinical work, with a research, and with education, which we think is a very important triangle that we try really to grow, we try to increase, because I think it's, a, it's not a magic, but it's a positive relationship between us. The, we are a sanctuary hospital. The hospital was built at the end of 19th century and was uh, opened, was a start in 1906, so approximately more than 120 years uh, ago. And as you can see here, how it changed. At the beginning of the hospital in 1906, there was nothing at all, just fields, as you can see here, country fields. Uh, but now you can see the image. 
that's the surgery rooms and that's our uh, hall, our main entrance of uh, the hospital, and that's the figure that I just uh, presented. We are approximately uh, here, and that's the Sterokoplovich Investigation uh, Center. Uh, we are a public hospital. We were a beneficiary hospital at the beginning, and now we are a public hospital. We depend from the Catalonia health system, and that's uh, very important. There are two different public systems here in Catalonia. One is the Catalan Institute of Health, and the other one is what we name CISCAT. But at the end of the day, are quite similar, and both are and, and, bel and belongs to the Catalan public health system, which we name uh, Cat Salud. Uh, important thing, we are a campus and we have a really an idea and we have in our mind the campus idea. That's the hospital clinic with the acute care, with the clinical work. The CATSBE is the primary, primary care and we are uh, and we belong to the CATSBE. Barna Clinic is our private structure, a small private structure with a lot of critics, but we try to survive. That's the educational part with the Faculty of Medicine from the University of Barcelona and that's the resource part. Research is crucial for us. There are one main institute, which is uh, EDIBAPS, and we have quite collaborations with is global, and that's the uh, La Caixa Foundation, which is also important for us. But the main uh, research institute for us is EDIBAP. It's our reference uh, institution and our reference uh, research institute. We are in Barcelona. That's the crowd in Barcelona. Barcelona is divided approximately, we have approximately 2 million inhabitants, and it's divided in quarters. We are in the left uh, quarters, and we are the main hospital in this left quarter with a little bit more than half a million inhabitants. In Catalonia, we live around 7.5 inhabitants, approximately, it depends the moment, and we are also a tertiary hospital for Catalonia for different pathologies, and also in some points we are uh, referenced also in Spain and in some pathologies uh, from the European uh, net for the European uh, networks. That's our activity and our point. Uh, as you can see here, we have approximately 800 beds. We discharge close to 50,000 patients per year. In those patients, we take care of around half a million. Uh, the number of patients in the emergency room is more than 100,000. That's the number of surgical intervention, more than 20,000. We work here a little bit more than uh, 4,500 uh, employers, and our budget is around 500 uh, millions of uh, euros. That's the figure of our hospital. And the important thing, we are a structure, we are divided in institute. That's something that we started more than 20 years ago in 1996, what we name it's Prisma. And as you can see here, there are 10 clinical institutes one of respiratory, cardiovascular, nephrology, uh, hematology, hematology and oncology, digestive and metabolic disease, 10 clinical institutes, two diagnosis centers, one of uh, bi biomedical, one of image, and there are dif uh, three different transversal structures. One is emergency room, one is surgical rooms, and the third is pharmacy. All this structure was uh, started approximately in 1996, and I think we are quite proud about this structure. It's not easy, but I think this decentralized, it's quite good for the patients, and then we work very close surgeons and physicians and many different structures. So I think that's quite a special structure in a, in a hospital, in all hospital, but we are quite proud about that and we think it's a positive uh, structure. We, of course, collaborate with the different health uh, partners and with the different health actors, and especially with the primary care. We have a, sp a specific primary care which belongs to the hospital, but there are other partners in, in our area and we have a quite a strong relationship with them. We also collaborate with different hospitals here in Catalonia in a, in a quite a strong a strategic alliance, which we think is important for patients, for the health system, and also for the future of the hospital. We also have an uh, international uh, uh, alliance, a uh, 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 strategic alliance, uh, quite close with this global, try to cooperate with different uh, institutions all around the world, especially in Africa. We have also quite a good collaboration with uh, developed centers in Sweden, in, uh, in uh, Deutschland, in the state. And I am sure that in the next future, we have a very strong collaboration with uh, Israel, with uh, Tel Aviv uh, University. 
we are a quite acceptable good hospital and here you can see our benchmarking and usually in the picture we have a quite good uh, range and uh, usually we are number one number two in spain it depends if it's a study from barcelona it's from madrid but usually we have a quite good uh, position and you can see here the numbers and also when we consider specialities we are really the first one and in the reputation index we have the top uh, leadership in 11 of 13 specialities. So in general, have a quite good position also when we consider the selected uh, place, the selected position for uh, young uh, fellowships, young uh, physicians who finish the career and want to do the uh, speciality. And then I finish here. I just want to mention that research and innovation, it's crucial for us. We work as a campus, it's clinical work, research and innovation and education. And I think it's really the way to progress, the way to interact, because we are the same. I use a white coat, but I do some research and I am also a full professor at the university. And many of us has exactly the three heads working together, which we think really it's a positive triangle for us. So thank you very much. And again, welcome to be in Barcelona and welcome to be our campus. And I give the word to Dr. Elias Campo, who will talk about research and innovation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, good morning. I think uh, I'd like to introduce uh, what we understand research in this campus with this um, with this picture because um, conveys uh, several ideas in one. You see on the left um, a lab, on the right a patient. And this is uh, our understanding how we uh, drive uh, research here. We are uh, this idea of translational clinical research, asking questions in the clinics, trying to solve them in the lab, going back to the patient. And also you see that this is not a real picture. This is a drawing and uh, this is a, um, a a result of an activity that we have uh, periodically. Unfortunately, with the COVID, we stop it. This is uh, one day of open doors that we invite uh, aficionados, sketchers, or uh, professionals to come to our institute and interpret uh, what we do by, uh, by their drawings. And we try to publish a little um, uh, publication with this drawing. And also we have an exhibit in the social uh, and the social um, center for the, the area. So we try to communicate our science to our neighbors and our society. And also this is a result of, uh, you will see on the entrance, uh, we uh, have every year a contest of scientific pictures uh, to promote uh, art and science uh, among, among uh, our researchers because I think creativity goes hand by hand. As uh, Dr. Campistol said, uh, we are in this crowded uh, center of Barcelona in which uh, all these institutions merge together. And uh, the difficulties that the lack of space uh, generate, uh, we try to take advantage of the proximity of all of us uh, that also has their own advantage. Uh, I, I like to emphasize that the history of research in this center is not just a history of a few days. And, uh, and the commitment of our uh, uh, population in the hospital is very strong. And that started uh, already in the 70s uh, of the last century, uh, when uh, uh, the, the doctors of the hospital realized that research was very important to develop a, a good clinical uh, practice. And uh, already at that time, uh, they decide to donate 1.5% of the salary to promote research activities among the faculty of the hospital. At that time, we didn't have much uh, funding from public agencies. And we used this salary uh, to uh, facilitate that our residents that finish uh, the residence program could devote one, two years uh, to research. And that each year, some of us uh, could go abroad in a sabbatical uh, to learn and to bring back uh, the experience of uh, foreign experience. And this was created by our, you want to, to sell our founder fathers, 
but generation after generation we vote if we want to keep uh, this donation and we do and particularly uh, difficult was in the one decade ago with the major crisis economical crisis our salaries were reduced by law but still at that time the doctors of this hospital decide to maintain this donation to keep uh, this activity because we thought this um, promotion of ourselves uh, was crucial for our own careers but also for the, the hospital later on uh, was um, one of our directors dr uh, juan rodez uh, was a, had a vision uh, that uh, the fundings that we were getting uh, from research were mixed uh, with the fundings of the hospital and everything was mixed and everything knew, nobody knew how it was used so he decided uh, that uh, research uh, money had to be f managed in a different way than the money that came to the hospital. And that's what he created this foundation that uh, since then was the first foundation created in the national health system of Spain to manage independently of the hospital the funding, the fundings of research. And that gave us some selective advantage if you want to, to promote uh, research in our campus. And then 25 years ago, the Catalan government uh, created a, a national in Catalonia system uh, to promote uh, competitive uh, research and created a, s a specific research institutes in our uh, Catalan system. And one of the first to be created was this, EDVAPS, that was close to the uh, hospital. And uh, this uh, institute was born with the idea to bring basic and translational research very close, uh, intim intimately integrated uh, with uh, the, the activity and already a strong research of clinical research in our hospital. Now we are in the process of merging these two entities because uh, what was a selective advantage 25 years ago now is a complicated management that we need to simplify. But we are in this process and hopefully this e uh, at the beginning of this year we, we will be only one foundation EDVAPS. So that's uh, our goal. Um, how we are organized? It's not difficult, it's not easy to organize such a large community in, uh, here. And uh, we organize ourselves in five major areas that uh, respond to immunology and biological mechanisms of defense, uh, some uh, clinical related to respiratory, cardiovascular, renal liver and uh, digestive and metabolism, neuroscience and oncology and hematology. And then we have some groups that are considered interdisciplinary uh, that uh, complete uh, our, our structural organization. We have, uh, since uh, uh, the beginning, a strong uh, platforms, technological transversals. Uh, we have a very strong biobank uh, with um, uh, with a lot of samples collected from the from the from the hospital, this is one of m our major resources for translational research, and we are very active in the sense that uh, very few weeks uh, uh, after the COVID pandemic started, we were able to create a specific line of COVID bank uh, to create a, a, a line of uh, collecting samples of these patients. Now we, we have more than 50,000 samples from uh, COVID, uh, COVID, and that was very integrated with the activity of the hospital. We have medical statistics, uh, flow cytometry, genomics, uh, imaging, also very interconnected with the activity of the hospital. So we have some of these platforms are, are uh, um, joint ventures between the institute and the, and the hospital. And those are complementary with the uh, technological platforms that we have in the medical school. So we never, uh, from the beginning, we tried not to uh, um, reproduce. Uh, we try to uh, complement each other. There are other platforms in the in the in the faculty in the medical uh, school, so we can uh, complement the, the technological platforms in the campus. Some numbers. Uh, all all of that could be could be um, uh, in different ways. Uh, we, we we have, uh, as you see, almost two thousand people in the campus working. Uh, on research. That means these people in a way or another uh, has a, a related to, to, to research institute in, in the institution. We, we generate around 1,800 uh, uh, um, original articles, not reviews, not uh, editorials in, in, in the campus uh, with a relatively these bibliometric aspects. We also uh, were of the main institutions capturing uh, funding from, uh, from international resources uh, and the uh, uh, Spanish and Catalan agencies. 
we have some uh, projects from the European Union, uh, NIH, uh, etc. And also, we are very interested in promoting uh, innovation and transference. Uh, this is uh, still uh, uh, a lesson that we have to learn, uh, but uh, we are trying and we are doing uh, relatively well uh, with um, the situation that we have in Spain. Uh, we have a portfolio of around 50 patents. Some of them, a uh, large number, have been licenses, and we have created uh, over the last uh, years uh, some uh, spin-offs. That some of them are doing well, some others have some limitations, but this is the history of transferring knowledge into uh, practice. Those are the different, uh, the different um, uh, start, uh, um, uh, startups uh, that we have uh, generated. Some of them, uh, you see, very uh, relatively recently in different aspects of translation of, uh, of uh, research. And as I mentioned, we are very aware that science has to be communicated uh, to the society, and we are very proud of organizing uh, social activities, uh, starting with the little ones. And uh, some years ago, the, the head of the um, uh, Office of Communication came with the idea of creating a summer camp, uh, science summer camp for kids. And it's uh, really one of the things that I am uh, really proud that uh, has uh, very success. And also high school um, teachers and also uh, people in, in the neighborhood. So I think uh, um, uh, those are examples of the pictures that we are creating. And one of the um, uh, important things that uh, the campus offer and uh, we are uh, trying to promote is this uh, figure of uh, the clinician scientist. I think uh, that's one of the figures that many years ago, many of us, uh, thanks to these grants that we could go abroad, uh, we ourselves were practicing medicine. I, uh, as a pathologist, was diagnosing uh, cases under the microscope, and I was uh, performing my translational research. So this figure, I think, is uh, very important in our campus. But we uh, have analyzed that this uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, a, a, a species in, uh, how do we say, a danger um, a species of disappearing. Uh, the difficulties of uh, having uh, the same person, this ability to, to do clinical and, 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 and research is becoming more and more difficult for many different reasons that we have analyzed. For that reason, we have created a dedicated uh, career track to promote uh, this, uh, this figure, uh, starting already with our residents that finish, that we, as I said, uh, we fund from ourselves two years that some of them competitively can de dedicate. Then from the EDVAPs, uh, we promote some programs uh, with different uh, instruments uh, that we take uh, the, res the resident after two years. Then we promote these um, programs that we call PhD for MD that uh, we collaborate with basic research centers uh, of the city to have uh, doctoral thesis uh, monitored by one clinician, one basic scientist uh, to promote this idea. Also, we have uh, some programs funded by the, co-funded by the European Union at postdoc level. Uh, um, and then we have two programs uh, to incorporate uh, uh, junior res uh, clinician researchers in the hospital in which from the uh, research institute we protect 50% uh, of the time uh, to be devoted uh, for research. And at more senior level, we have a, a program in which we protect 80% uh, of the time of these researchers. Unfortunately, funding, funding restrictions uh, limit our, uh, these programs to very uh, few, but I think they are quite successful. And we try to fight this tendency to lose uh, scientific, uh, clinician scientists with this, with this program. We have other ideas in mind. And then just some examples of, uh, of the uh, relatively large projects that we are developing here. Uh, not going into details, but uh, our groups uh, have had a very strong impact in the scientific community by showing the benefits of the Mediterranean diet in different uh, protecting uh, uh, different uh, cardiovascular and other diseases. We have also a very strong program uh, promoting uh, population-based uh, strategies to prevent colorectal cancer. This is now a, a long program with uh, long follow-up and having very important results that are resulting in adoption on, on, on measures by the National Health Service. Also, we'll see uh, in, in our program uh, a an, an strong program in neuroscience uh, discovering and 
and uh, uh, investigating autoimmune and neurological diseases. Uh, so more than 10 years ago, we were pioneers uh, in, our, in our country in, uh, in bringing uh, the genome sequencing technologies in large scale projects. We participated in the International Cancer Genome Project by sequencing the first genomes of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We participated then in the European um, Blueprint Epigenome, and we continue uh, with this idea that uh, genome and epigenome uh, uh, technologies are bringing new perspective to personalized medicine. In, in, um, we also have groups uh, investigating new, new uh, surgery technologies. Um, we are very strong in, in uh, liver cancer with uh, a reference uh, center. Uh, new protocols of treatment have been generated in this center. And also more recently, we have a strong program in immunotherapy um, uh, that emerged. Uh, I, I always like uh, to emphasize that this program started not five, six years ago. It started more than 20 years, 25 years ago, when the immunology department uh, created a, li a line to generate uh, monoclonal antibodies that now, uh, almost 25 years ago, have been able to be used uh, for these CAR T cell technologies. They, those are our own uh, uh, antibodies, so we don't depend on the big pharma to, to create them. So we uh, um, just uh, um, uh, a few time, a few uh, months ago, or one year ago, we, we had the first academic CAR T cell, uh, academic CAR -T cell in Europe that was approved by the regulatory agencies to be used in, um, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So this is a, a, a global view of uh, what we are doing. I hope that we will be able to show and share more. And again, this other picture, as I said, this uh, close relationship between the Sterkopolovic Center and the hospital that I think is crucial to, to bring both uh, science, clinical and research together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campo. Thank you very much, Elias. And then we move to the Faculty of Medicine, University of Barcelona, with uh, Dr. Trilla. Tony. Right. Uh, I promise you to be very brief, and I would like uh, to begin uh, Presenting you or introducing you, Dr. Jose Maria Nicolás, who is the Vice Dean of Postgraduate Affairs and many other things at the faculty, has been the key person for organizing a big portion of this meeting. So, Jose Maria, muchas gracias. Uh, the University of Barcelona is a huge and old university, the oldest university here in, in Catalonia. Uh, is located in many different places uh, surrounding Barcelona and the metropolitan area. It has a total of 16 schools or faculties, depending if you use the more English or the more traditional uh, term. Uh, close to 6,000 teachers and researchers, uh, 42,000 graduate students, 12,500 uh, of postgraduate students, and students, sorry, and these uh, manage with a very low budget compared to similar universities and better universities all over the world. So just it's lower than the budget of the hospital, and it's certainly lower than the budget for the football club Barcelona, uh, for, for example. But some miracles happen in life, and the hard work of all the professors, the researchers, and the students at the university, and especially at the School of Medicine, uh, allow us to be year after year, in, and depending on the ranking, there are at least seven or eight different ranks of universities every year, and if you go to medicine and, and health science, but now specifically to medicine, our medical school is ranked among the first in Spain, nearly always. We play between the 15, 20, 25 position in the European Union universities, and be uh, on the 50, 60 better universities in the world. And that's it's a great honor for us to be there because it's not an easy task. It depends very much on the research that is done on all the institutions that you have seen, but also on the opportunities that our students work thereafter in the medical profession, how long they take uh, to get a position and things, and things like that. Uh, 
the school uh, gathers uh, different different types of degrees uh, in the in the um, in the different campuses. I will show you. Uh, the oldest is medicine. And 270 students are admitted each year here to study medicine, either in the main campus, the clinic campus, or in the Belbice campus. Uh, I believe that in Israel should be pretty much the same. It's a six-year long career. Then we have also uh, nurses, a nursing school, with um, a little bit more uh, alumni uh, um, that enter the school every year. Then we have a very specific and new for us uh, career that it's very helpful and, and show us the benefits of working together with hospitals that's biomedical engineering with nearly 45 new students admitted each year and we also have uh, biomedical science mostly devoted to research uh, working on the industry and things like that and also in the Belbice campus the school of dentistry and the school of pathology the main reason for us to be here is to try to teach us the better that we can, especially uh, to our students, how to learn to be good physicians. They are all excellent students. They are very compromised in social terms uh, students, and they have a high standard of ethics. And this is the main thing that we want to preserve and increase during the six years that they uh, share their life with all of us. We rely very much on the practice of medicine. So the teaching in, in, the, in the medical school is mostly devoted to learn the job as a physician. You have to go to the hospital, you have to go to the primary care, you have to go to palliative care, to all these things. So we have a lot of university, uh, that uh, university hospitals, that's, let's say that the high rank and affiliated to our university hospitals and also primary care centers. You can see here the campus in Belbice, when you come from the airport, is the main hospital, it's uh, University of Barcelona Hospital here. In the middle, you have the, the main entrance uh, the, of the School of Medicine that you will visit uh, a few hours from now on. And then for the pediatric and so also for obstetrics and some part of obstetrics and gynecology, we have another campus in the, in the north part of the uh, entrance of Barcelona. That's the Hospital of San Juan de Deu. But you can see many other hospitals, small community hospitals located in different parts of Barcelona or the surrounding area. Also, uh, the research institutes in different ways the University of Barcelona is always present in these research institutes and as Dr. Campistol and, and Dr. Elias Campo has mentioned we uh, sometimes uh, play with the uniform of the university but also with the uniform of the hospital or the uniform of the research institute so in, in, in some way we are pretty much the same in, 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 in many different aspects and finally uh, our main capital is our, is our students I don't know, but I bet that in Israel will be pretty much the same. 70% of our medical students are women. And they are very bright, like the men also, that enters the school. Uh, it's not an easy task to be admitted here. It's one of the highest, uh, let's say, admittance uh, degree or uh, score that you have to gain to be here. And uh, we are certainly devoted to, to them. Some of them at the end will become physicians here in Catalonia, physicians in other parts of the world. They move and some of them will also be devoted to their research. Our School of Medicine has the highest uh, rate of uh, doctoral thesis uh, defended and presented every year, year after year. So we are very proud of all these uh, new, these are the new promotion for a couple of years ago. And hopefully uh, this year in September, we'll start another academic course and hopefully Six years from now on, maybe, maybe some of them during the career could go to Tel Aviv University. That would be a good thing to do. And the Tel Aviv uh, University students can come here to be with us. And who knows? Uh, some of them maybe end up uh, working in Israel and some uh, from Israel end, work, end up working here. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the rector of the University of Barcelona, um, you are very welcome to our city, to our university. And I hope that you will enjoy your short and very uh, uh, packed uh, stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trilla. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. And now it's time, uh, Dr. Friedman, to know a little bit more about the Tel Aviv uh, University. Please. Okay. So 
stay, take, whatever. It's okay. Um, yeah. So here, actually, I'm going to give you a very short glimpse of what is Tel Aviv University, which our motto and our logo is pursuing the unknown. And that's what we do actually every day in our labs and in, in when we teach also too. So first, let's say that Tel Aviv University shares this city, Tel Aviv's unshakable spirit of openness and innovation. And Tel Aviv University, as you probably heard, the Israeli is the startup nation. So Tel Aviv University is the top university feeding the Israeli innovation ecosystem. Actually, 50% of all the startups were launched or are led today by Tel Aviv graduates. It was established in 1956 and today is the largest university uh, in Israel and also the most comprehensive institution uh, in Israel and the largest uh, research institution. We have annually more than 30,000 students in our, on our campus. Uh, we have nine different faculties going from exact science, life sciences, medicine, and humanities and arts. Uh, we have 126 different departments and schools. Uh, yearly, we have more than $230 million in investment in research and development uh, investment. And every, uh, in any given time, we have 3,500 projects running uh, on campus. We also home uh, the new Natural History Museum in Israel, which is part of the country's largest and most comprehensive biodiversity and environmental studies center. And hopefully, if you are coming next time to Tel Aviv, we will take you there because it's an amazing, amazing museum. Uh, we were talking recently about rankings, and every university loves to give their own rankings. So Tel Aviv University is actually at the top 100 global innovation uh, universities. We are also ranked in the top 20 in terms of scientific citations. We are top 10 outside the US for patents and top 10 for VC, backed startup founders. Uh, we, have, uh, we are at the top of the 30 business schools and 15 international film uh, schools. But the most important thing I will say, or the contribution of Tel Aviv University, is to the research innovation. And we were sharing this with here with the clinic uh, institution. And I think the, the secret to, to that is the excellent basic and applied research, which feeds you know, the innovation and the stream. And Tel Aviv University actually fosters, and I think this is very important today, is the interdisciplinary orientation, which of course opens the uh, imagination of in the creativity of uh, all the students, as well as us, the faculty uh, members. Tel Aviv University also has Ramot, which is our technology, uh, technology transfer company, which is the responsible for the commercial transactions with the industry. Uh, it also responsible for IP protection and the value enhancements. And we talked before about the startup nation. Actually, Tel Aviv is the ecosystem. We have more than 60 startup companies that started from uh, professors, faculty uh, in Tel Aviv. This is just uh, a few of the companies and we have many more. And actually approximately 10 new companies are uh, founded per year uh, from faculty from the Tel Aviv members of Tel Aviv University. We also have a very rich uh, array of English language programs for international students from 60 different countries. We have more than 2,000 uh, students from uh, different parts of the world. And here's the website. If there's any student here thinking about maybe 
moving and trying to come to Tel Aviv. I have to say that every year we have new programs opening and here maybe I will switch to uh, make some uh, promotion of we have a new program for uh, neuroscience. I'm one of the co-directors and we are encouraging every year and accepting new students and actually those who are accepted they have full tuition and they have full fellowship so i encourage you to go to this website and try to see uh, which programs do we have uh, to share and i wanted to present you and show you i mean the strong fields that we have in tel aviv university which you can see they are very diverse. I mean, we go from drug discovery, neuroscience, but we also have, we also have bi biblical archaeology, Jewish studies, business, food security. And today, of course, the small delegation are coming here. We are probably sh sharing some of the cancer research mostly, but maybe a little bit of neuroscience if me and Dr. Lior Mayo can consider ourselves also neuroscientists. And of course, we mentioned before, and this is very important for Tel Aviv University, then that's the reason we are here, of course, is the international relationships. Here's just a, a very short list of all these uh, important relations with uh, different institutions and universities. And our goal today is to add you know, our collaboration to this list. And we also have, and it's very important and since we are both institutions uh, considered in Europe, at least in terms of science, uh, we also uh, rank fourth in Europe for prestigious ERC young researchers uh, grant, the ERC. And actually, I have to say that yesterday we were celebrating our colleague, my friend, Dr. Adi Barzel. He just got his ERC consolidator, so congrats again. Uh, and with that, I guess I will leave uh, and thank you and, of course, the Foundation, Esther Koplovich, for giving us this amazing opportunity to get to know your institution. And the idea is to leave to these four days or two very days that we are here with collaboration projects and show you even more uh, what we can do in Tel Aviv University. So thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to our symposium. Thanks. That's good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Frigman. Thank you very much, Dinora. Now I think we know a little bit more uh, each other, and maybe now after this welcome and brief introduction, it's time to work and it's time to go to the personalized medicine. And I think you will share the first uh, session. Perfect. So thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll have a good time, a very productive time. And I'm sure that will be, as we mentioned, the first of a very long and very fruitful collaboration. So thank you very much to be here, and we'll follow the scientific meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And yes, I, I will start with uh, our first session and I guess I'll introduce myself. I will say that I'm a professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, also today known as the School of Neurobiology, Biochemistry and Biophysics at the uh, Life Science Faculty, Tel Aviv University. And today I thought about sharing one of the projects or a little bit of maybe two. Uh, that my lab has been working uh, recently, which has to do with uh, CAR-T. So we heard that your institution has been doing it, so I'm, I'm happy that we can bring uh, our, well, our research uh, to you today. So we'll start by mentioning one of the challenges we face today in cancer research, among many that we have, but of course is tumor heterogeneity. And tumor heterogeneity actually comes in many different flavors. We have spatial heterogeneity, we have temporal heterogeneity, we have intra and intertumor heterogeneity, and of course we have primary and metastatic heterogeneity. And today I'm going to be focusing on one of the most heterogeneous uh, human tumors, and that is glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, or in short, GBM is the most malignant of the primary brain tumors and is almost always a fatal. Nearly all the GBM patients that are di diagnosed with the disease, they have a median survival between 12 uh, to 15, maybe today even gets to 16 uh, months. But that is even if they go through the standard of care treatment, which consists first surgery, if it's possible, we're talking about the brain, it's not always possible, but they will go on the surgery and then a series of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. 
Malignant gliomas are also among the most vascular human tumors, so they were very attractive to the first line of antiangiogenic therapy, and I will share a little bit of this uh, subject uh, in the next uh, few slides. So we know and we have learned uh, a lot from uh, human samples, human uh, studies of GBM. Actually, GBM was the first type of tumors to be sequenced by what we know as the Cancer Genome Network Atlas, the TCGA. And we learned many things about the genetics and the mutations. But still, uh, in order to understand more uh, this disease in terms of the basic science, but also in terms of translational, we, and especially my lab, we are very uh, good fans of what we call the mouse models of human diseases. So uh, in particular today, I'm going to introduce you a, a mouse model for cancer, for GBM, that I believe it's helping us to understand better the disease and also to bring these new strategies for uh, therapy. So our model, it consists uh, of using a lentivirus, a lentivector, as you can see here, uh, it's a special vector in the terms that uh, we clone a cassette that separates the promoter from the gene of interest. So in this situation, we do not have expression of the gene because this cassette, that is a flux cassette, has a stop column here, so we don't have expression of the gene. Only in the presence of Cree recombinance, and for those who are familiar, this is called the Cree lox p system, this cassette would be cut out, and now we have expression of our gene of interest. In our case, it will be a potent oncogene like HRAS. We also have a fluorescent reporter, and uh, we also added a second hit in the form of a shRNA that targets, for example, a tumor suppressor gene like P53. So this is our vector. We, of course, prepare the lentiviral uh, particles, and the idea now is to inject directly into the brain, mice that are transgenic for the Cree recombinase. Uh, so this way we're going to be inducing the tumors, uh, hopefully in as few as 20, 50 cells, uh, or ideally we would like to go and recapitulate what happens in humans, right? That the cancer starts from one, two, a few cells. So we were able to go down to a, a very few cells and to turn on and start these tumors. Now, this uh, type of system gives us a lot of flexibility. First of all, we can now use all the data that we have at the DCGA and look at which mutations, which genes uh, are considered oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and clone them in our vectors. And the reason we started with HRAS, as you can see here, is because it's a surrogate of EGF receptor or loss of NF1, and we combine it with loss of P53, which is also, this is a very common and very uh, uh, famous uh, slide that we show from the TCJ data. Not only that, we can also inject our virus in any location in the brain, and we have the mouse atlas, and we have the coordinates. So with a stereotactic instrument, we can go and inject. We know we can mimic glioblastoma, but then we have other types of tumors that the location is important. And also if we want to hit different cell types, we will go to the niche where these cells are expressed, as you can see here. We can go to the hippocampus, we can go to the cortex, and we can see actually which cells were infected because we have this fluorescent reporter. So after injecting the virus, we can uh, euthanize the mice, sacrifice the mice, and do sections and see and even count which cells actually were infected. Today, I have to say uh, that we have taken this system and we are, are trying to bring models of pediatric brain tumors by injecting our viruses into newborn paps, but the focus of today will be mostly on adult uh, glioblastoma. Let me show you how specific is this system. Here is a coronal section of the mouse brain of a GFAP Cree transgenic uh, brain, and you can see if we stain for Cree, uh, we can see it very nicely. We also can stay for astrocytes or neuroprogenitor cells in the hippocampus with a marker called GFAP. And you can see very nicely the overlay. So GFAP cells will be expressed in Cree. But if we now stain with a marker of neurons, we don't have this overlay. 
That means that when we inject our virus, we only gonna have a infection and expression of our oncogene in Cree expressing cells, which are GFAP positive cells. What happens if we inject now our virus in a wild type mouse? We still have expression of our RFP, the red fluorescent protein, because there's no Cree here to excise that uh, cassette. We have leakiness, we have some GFP, but we, most importantly, we don't have expression of the oncogene. Only when we infect that GFAP Cree transgenic mice, we have expression of the oncogene. So this is just to show you how the model system work. And now a little bit of history to bring you to the project that, that I want to uh, discuss with you today. Uh, at the time, a few years back, we were collaborating with Professor Erki Roslari uh, at the, the time you see as Santa Barbara. And he believes, uh, or his lab actually believes, that there are these vascular zip codes in angiogenesis and metastasis. We all know that tumors uh, stimulate angiogenesis to secure a blood supply for the growing tumor. And the activated endothelial cells and pericytes in this neovasculature actually expresses molecules, markers, that are not expressed in much, or at least in much lower levels in normal vessels. So we have now these markers that are very specific to tumor vasculature. Well, that's what we call the vascular zip codes, which give us an opportunity to target, not precisely target the, the delivery of different therapies to these tumors. So what we did at the time is that we took homing peptides. These are the peptides that we are using to coat different nanoparticles and bring, in this case, for example, a proapoptotic peptide specifically to the tumors. I'm not going to describe this story, uh, just to show you that we were able to treat these mice, we extended the survival of these mice. Here's just a section showing you how specific uh, we were able to bring these peptides to the vasculature of the tumors that are represented by GFP. So if we are talking about a homing peptide that leads and gets to the tumor, that means that there has to be a receptor, right, in these cells, in the endothelial cells, bringing this peptide and internalizing these particles. So the next story or the next idea was to try to identify the receptor that it binds to this homing peptide. And this was the second story. And here's where it started uh, to be interesting. We found a receptor called P32 that in normal cells primarily is localized in the mitochondria, inside of the cells. But in tumor cells and in the vasculature associated with these tumors is translocated to the surface and is expressed uh, in the tumor, in the surface primarily. So for us, uh, or for me at least, I'm coming from a background uh, working in my PhD in immunotherapy with a pioneer of the technique or the strategy that I'm going to present you now, which is the CAR T therapy. For those who are not familiar here in the audience, uh, CAR T or chimeric antigen receptor therapy is based on the immune system, the patient's immune system. We isolate uh, from the blood, the white blood cells, specifically the T cells, and we engineer them ex vivo to express the chimeric antigen receptor, which is composed of a, a ectodomain, a single chain antibody that recognizes the molecule expressed, the biomarker, the antigen on the tumor cells, and then is fused to an endodomain, which is the intracytoplasmic signaling domain of the T cell. It can be a stimulation and co stimulation signal. So now that we engineer these cells, they are expanded and they're reinfused back to the patient. So there are many challenges now with this technology. It has a great success in B malignancies, in leukemia, but bringing this type of strategy to solid tumors uh, faces many obstacles. Some of them are listed here. We have tumor heterogeneity, we have the T cell trafficking and infiltration to this mass, you know, to the tum solid tumors, and we are facing an immune suppressive microenvironment. And today I'm going to focus first on tumor heterogeneity and second, a little bit on immune uh, suppressive. So I just told you that we were able to identify a marker expressed uh, specifically in tumor 
cells or tumor vasculature. And so we brought it back to glioblastoma and we stained patient samples and we noticed that DEP32 uh, marker is expressed mostly in GBM or it goes up with the grade of the glioma. Here are just examples of our models, the Syngenic model and the Xeno PD, PD, PDX uh, models. We have expression of the messenger RNA based on TCJ data, but most importantly for us, it's expressed on the surface of any cell that we uh, checked or tested. Murine-derived cells from our model, established cell lines, and most importantly, patient-derived cell lines. So, as I said, I have a history on CAR-T. I actually did my PhD with a pioneer of this uh, technology, Zalik Deshar. And so we designed a second-generation CAR-T that now has an, a single-chain antibody that recognizes P32. And we are working in parallel transducing murine lymphocytes as well as human lymphocytes. So we have these two different models. So we introduced this using retroviral vectors, retroviruses, and we have infection of the cells. We can follow that by M. cherry fluorescent reporter. And we did some functional uh, analysis uh, of our CAR-T. First in vitro, uh, in our murine system, we have different cell lines that we work. And we also use as a control, we knock down the expression of P32 to see how specific our CAR T's are. And as you can see, the only ones that are giving us cytolytic activity are the P32 specific CAR T. We also have an irrelevant CAR T completely directed to an uh, irrelevant antigen. And the only one giving us response is the P32. We also have proliferation assays and we have stimulation assays based on interferon gamma secretion. Exactly the same line of experiments we did with human cells, established human glioma cells, as well as patient-derived glioma cells. Then we move to uh, in vivo, and for in vivo, we use different models. We have the uh, we tested first our syngenic model, where we transplant murine glioma cells in intracranially, and we come uh, systemically. We give this CAR T through the tailband, and we got a very good uh, extension of survival. Even 30% of the patient, the patient, the mice patients, uh, were uh, cured. We didn't see any tumors. Then we used the U87, which is a really well-known uh, cell line in GBM. We This time we went intratumoral. And with our last uh, model, which is a patient-derived xenograft, this is a very aggressive cell line in 20 days or less even is the median latency. We give this intratumoral but also intraventricular. And this is based on a, a report in New England Journal of Medicine, which they treat glioma patients and they notice that the route of administration really matters and going directly to the ventricles help for diffusion and of course try to avoid any cytotoxicity or any off-target effects that they, this uh, CAR-T may have. As you can see, we were able very nicely to, to kill cells that express P32. If this is a relevant or untreated uh, group, we can see that the treated group went down. So here, just to show you that we are not only targeting our tumor cells, I mentioned before that the tumor vasculature plays a very important uh, role. And a few years back, we showed that uh, tumor cells have the capacity to differentiate and form their own endothelial cells, their own blood vessels. And this work is published, but the most important thing is that these tumor-derived endothelial cells are VGF receptor 2 negative. And this, of course, explains why most of the patients are treated with uh, avastin or bevacizumab actually relapse and recur and they have tumors because they are resistant. They are not, uh, these tumor, these blood vessels actually are completely uh, independent of BGF uh, angiogenesis. And I can show you here that we are actually killing and targeting also tumor derived endothelial cells. Here are the untreated uh, mice and you see that they have high vascular genesis or high angiogenesis. And when we check the treated mice, the, the blood vessel density uh, went down. So what I want to show you is, yes, we have tumor heterogeneity. One single target won't be enough. And so what we are going to do now and what we're doing in the lab now is trying to 
bring the new, the antigens are known to be expressed combined with our antigen and we give different uh, ways to uh, treat uh, and, and target different antigens by what we call dual target card vectors by co-administration, co-transduction, and we're engineering and trying all these strategies in the lab. But as I said before, this is not enough. We have this immune suppressive microenvironment, and the idea is to do this switch between a cold tumor and going to a hot tumor. And here uh, we are trying uh, to reprogram, you know, remodel the tumor microenvironment using a uh, as one uh, strategy, introducing a cytokine called IL-12. IL-12 has a pleiotropic function, but is ideal for immunotherapy combinations because not only recruit innate immune cells, but in, very importantly for us, it reprograms the suppressive cells that infiltrate these tumors like myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And so we also have a story recently that we published that we show that actually these suppressive cells, we call them sometimes neutrophils, we can call them granulocytic, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, but these are very important. They come to the tumors, they are recruited from the periphery, and once they come to the tumor, they suppress the activity of T cells. So we, what we want to do again is to target this immune suppressive uh, microenvironment that is not only composed of these myeloid-derived suppressor cells, we also have macrophages. And in collaboration with uh, Professor Dan Per, who was supposed to be here, but unfortunately couldn't join us. Uh, he's an expert in uh, nanoparticles and expression of messenger RNAs, encapsulating messenger RNAs in nanoparticles. The idea is to bring these particles to transduce, to transfect the messenger RNA expressing IL-12 into macrophages, and by that way, switching their phenotype from a pro-tumorigenic to an anti-tumorigenic phenotype. And the techno the, his technology actually uh, works in a way that these particles are targeted by uh, an adapter that is coded uh, these uh, nanoparticles. And now you can provide that recognizes the FC part of the antibody. So you can put any antibody that you want to uh, target or, or direct these nanoparticles. In our case, we are using CD anti-C68. CD68 is a marker of macrophages. So here's just to show you that we indeed in our murine model, we validated that we have high expression of CD68. And now the idea is to introduce these particles inside the tumor, I mean inside intratumor or intraventricular. And we did first with a messenger RNA expressing luciferous, and you can see very nicely how they go to the tumors, but not when we, we use an isotype control. Remember, these are coated with a CD68 antibody targeting macrophages. And this is a, our preliminary result showing that when we inject the nanoparticles expressing uh, the messenger or carrying the messenger IL-12, we are able to express it in the tumors. This is one approach, and this is uh, my two last slides showing you that we are also trying a different strategy. We can go with nanoparticles and precision medicine, and we all can also go pharmacologically, try to deplete these uh, cells that are reaching uh, the tumors. And I mentioned that myelocytic or the myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells as, is a one population that is highly infiltrated in tumors. Uh, not only the original tumors, but once the tumors feel the pressure of the CAR T therapy, they also elevate this population even more. So the idea now is to combine with something that would deplete the cell, and this something comes from, again, a collaboration that we have with Professor Justin Lathia uh, in the US, where he found that fludarabine, that probably the, the, re the, si the physicians in, in, in the audience here know, is a, an immune suppressive drug that giving, you know, in high doses, it's used for preconditioning, but here we're using very low uh, concentrations that are specifically are targeting this population. And here you can see that after uh, two regimens of fludarabine, we can lower the expression of MDSCs. And now the idea is to combine this treatment with our CAR T cells. And as you can see here, this is just preliminary results, but we can see the trend of the uh, combination therapy being more 
successful compared to the monotherapy of CAR T cells. So in summary, what I, and I hope I'm uh, on time, I wanted to show you or I show you that we in the lab have developed this lentiviral induced GBM mouse model, which recapitulates all the hallmarks of the human disease. I show you these tumors are very heterogeneous and are very plastic. And one of the uh, examples is, is how tumor cells or cancer stem cells, I didn't mention that, they can differentiate to endothelial cells and form their own blood vessels. Uh, I show you that using this very elegant uh, mouse model, we were able to identify a new biomarker called P32 that in normal cells is expressed in the mitochondria, but in tumor cells translocate to the surface, which makes a very good and attractive target for CAR T therapy. And I show you that, you know, this help us maybe to contributing with a new marker in terms of this tumor heterogeneity, but it's not enough. We need to combine and target the other obstacles that we have in solid tumors. And this is an immune suppressive microenvironment. Here, we're trying different strategies. One is with nanoparticles loaded with a messenger RNA that codes for IL-12, trying to remodel the tumor microenvironment. And the second option or the second strategy uh, is to deplete some of these populations. I mentioned one of them, but of course we are trying uh, different uh, approaches to target and deplete uh, these uh, populations to facilitate the work, the persistence of these CAR T cells. So with that, I will thank uh, the members of my lab, especially the people that work in this uh, project, Liad Rusonuri and Ignacio Mastandrea. Shahar Mansour is working now with this tumor microenvironment remodeling. Our key collaborators, I'm still working with uh, Zeli Gashar and Anna Gloverson Levin, who at the uh, Ichilov Saraski Medical uh, Center, and we have collaborations here in Spain, in Estonia, uh, with Justin Tatia and Professor Dan Per. I mentioned some of them, and of course, uh, our funding agencies. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Uh, any questions from the audience? Anything that wasn't clear? Mm. I think I have to, maybe I will move because if there's something from home or in the lab. Yes, that is correct. Uh, I show you that we actually found this in our mouse model, and that was easy because the tumor cells are always GFP positive because the, the way we transduce or the transform these cells, we have this reporter. So when we look on sections, we could see that cells that express markers of endothelial cells were also GFP positive. And of course, we did many different essays to show that this is not a fusion between an endothelial cell. This is not a, a, a and these are functional blood vessels, there's blood flow in there. But I think the most important thing uh, was to find that these are VGF receptor 2 negative. And th this started in the mouse model, but of course it could be an artifact, right, of the model. So we went and checked on human samples. In human samples, we don't have GFP, but we have uh, mutations, right, EGF uh, variant 3. Uh, it's a very known mutation, so we co-stain with endothelial markers, and we also find it in human patients. So this shows you the plasticity of tumor cells. And I have to say that maybe we started and we are, we are the first ones showing this in brain tumors, that since then people have shown that this uh, is true uh, for renal cell carcinoma too, and breast cancer they found some. So I'm not sure if it's in all uh, tumors, uh, but in GBM we know this happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So for the first question, which is very interesting, uh, and actually one of the reviewers of our work asked, I mean, if we know why it translocates to the surface. And so we can only speculate at this moment. We don't know exactly why, but there is evidence that cells, uh, once they sense the difference in the extracellular matrix, you know, glioblastoma uh, expresses uh, receptors that sense the hyaluronic acid, that is very high in the ECM. So it needs to bring more receptors to adapt to these extracellular matrix changes in order to invade, in order to migrate. So there has been reports that show that there is translocation of proteins from the mitochondria to the surface in order to facilitate. So we believe P32 is in this family of proteins that are being recruited as a sense, a mechanosensing of the changes in the stiffness of the tumor. But of course, that's our speculations. We need to go into that. Uh, for the second question, uh, P32, and there's no single antigen today, at least in solid tumors, that is 100% expressed in every single. We know that there is tumor heterogeneity. And I can say that in, the, in P32, 30% um, of the tumors uh, express the uh, marker. And it's expressed both in cancer stem cells as well as in differentiated cells. And as I show you, even one more thing is expressing the tumor-derived endothelial cells. So maybe that's one thing that other antigens don't share with P32, and maybe that brings an advantage to using P32. But I'm a believer that one single antigen will not be enough. We will have to go with a cocktail, with dual targeting. Uh, one single, single one will be not be enough. Any other? I'm trying to, let me check the chat here. Yeah, I don't see any specific question. So with that, I guess we can move to our uh, next speaker in the session. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Iñaki Martin Subero from Campus Clinic, which I checked and he works fascinating <laughs> uh, field of epigenetics and, uh, and he did all the genetic analysis to try to understand the origin and processes and development of uh, actually leukemias, right? Mm -hmm. So with that, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to say that there is now a mic that if somebody has a question later, you can raise your hand after the, after the talk. So, well, th thanks a lot for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for having me here. Um, I, I, the first thing I have to find is my presentation. Here it is. So, so my group is the, is the, or the group I coordinate is the Biomedical Epigenomics Group here, two floors above us. Um, I, I, I've been coordinating this group in the last uh, uh, 12 years and I actually started here um, when Elias Campo asked me to, to join the group uh, to be part of this endeavor. He presented in his introduction on the genome and epigenome of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So I was working in another place and then he said, would you like to come here and then to do this analysis of the whole genome, uh, whole epigenome of this disease? And I was very, very excited to do so. And, and after 12 years, I'm still very happy to be here. So that's a good sign. Um, so uh, we do a lot of things related to epigenomics in lymphoid malignancies and some other conditions as well. But today I will summarize the results of a journey. Uh, we started then 12 years ago um, to, to study in detail, the epigenome of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And we started in a very naive way because sometimes when you start your group, you, you are hypothesis based. You have your hypothesis and you want to do research to, to answer that hypothesis. In our case, we started in a hypothesis free uh, way. So we just said, you know, the epigenetics at that time People were talking about the silencing of tumor suppressor genes in cancer, the hypermethylation, and basically the whole literature was talking about that. And many groups were starting, studying one gene, et cetera, et cetera. And then at that time, these new technologies with high density microarrays, with next generation sequencing were starting. And then we said, we start the group with one idea. Let's first describe, let's first see, uh, and let the data talk, and then let's see what we find. So today I will present the, the results of, of this journey, 
we started like a decade ago, uh, and I will kind of distill like the major messages that the data have told us, not the other way around. We just are learning from what uh, the, the data from the patients are, uh, are telling us. So the first thing is to define epigenetics, and epigenetics is basically the science of gene regulation. So every one of us has one genome, half from mom, half from dad, but we have multiple cells with multiple functions, multiple phenotypic manifestations. Why is that? Because in spite of sharing the same genome, they have different epigenomes. So the epigenomes is the science that tells us which genes are turned off and turned on. And, and this defines the cellular identity. And in cancer, the cellular identity in part is maintained, but is greatly modified as well. So this epigenetic information is coded at three different levels. At the Let's say the first dimension would be just the DNA strand, where we have DNA methylation, probably you've heard about, the most famous epigenetic mark, probably the, not the most uh, relevant in terms of gene regulation, but the best study, definitely. Uh, and also like hydroxymethylation and other derivatives of DNA methylation. Then we have the second level, which is these two meters of DNA are actually packed in the very tiny cell nucleus. And and this is achieved through wrapping the DNA into these proteins that are called histones, that have, they have a, an important uh, structural role, packing role, but also have an important regulatory role. And different histone modifications can uh, lead to different genome functions. And finally, these two meters of DNA form a three-dimensional network within the nucleus, and, and there is interactions from distant regions like for instance, a distant enhancer can regulate the gene by creating loops in the DNA that maybe in the, in the linear fashion, they are very far from each other, but in the 3D space, maybe close to each other. So this is the third layer of information uh, where epigenetics is informative. So this is a summary of uh, uh, some of the most relevant epigenetic marks that are useful to understand the functions of the genome. Um, the important thing is that if we want to understand gene expression, there is many studies that only take into consideration DNA methylation, or many studies that only take into consideration chromatin accessibility, like open chromatin, or one particular histone modifications, or even the 3D genome interactions. But actually, if we want to understand gene function, is the integrative analysis from all these different layers uh, what we need to do. And uh, you can imagine that the genome function could be like the melody that, uh, that uh, you know, an orchestra is playing. And if you, if you listen to the melody and only study one of the players, you will not be able to understand it properly. You need to understand what each player is doing, right? To properly understand the melody. And this is something very similar, what happens if we want to understand genome function, we really need to go to different, different layers of uh, regulation information. Now, the system we are very interested in is the B cell, both in its normal maturation program and also what happens when these cells stop maturation, start to clonally grow and create a tumor. So over the last decade, we have been describing the epigenome of the normal B cell differentiation program and of different B cell malignancies through different perspectives. And today I will summarize the results of the uh, four major studies that were focused ex exclusively in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. That was the disease where we, the, the, the whole program was, was very much focusing thanks to this, to this uh, CLL genome project. So we contributed to this epigenetics part. And I will tell you four stories for this disease. Uh, and the disease basically is, is a very frequent uh, leukemia. What makes this disease, I think, from the biological and clinical perspective, extremely relevant is that under the same diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we have an umbrella of biological and clinical behaviors. So we have a very low fraction of patients that spontaneously regress without any treatment. Patients that are diagnosed and not treated and can be without treatment for one or two decades. Patients that progress, even patients that transform to a high-grade lymphoma in a condition that's called Richter syndrome, that in this context is a fatal disease. So the same diagnosis, patients that without treatment spontaneously regress, patients that die in less than one year. So a very interesting disease to, to understand from the biological perspective which, are the, which, which conditions 
that particular clinical behavior. So overall, uh, there is two major groups being identified based on the somatic hypermutation of the immunoglobulins, uh, which basically reflect how mature the cells of origin uh, of these two diseases are. If the immunoglobulins are not mutated, the cell is less mature or has matured outside the, the, the germinal center and has a worse prognosis. And, and if there is somatic hypermutation, it's better prognosis. So this is with the best known, let's say, biomarker for predicting clinical behavior. So the four studies are related to, to DNA methylation, one to histone modifications and the integrative analysis of multiple marks, and one to the 3D genome structure. Now, when I started to uh, study DNA methylation, uh, I was reading the literature, and the literature was saying, cancer cells are characterized from the epigenomic perspective by global hypomethylation that affects repetitive elements and leads to chromosomal instability, and hypermethylation of CPG islands affecting tumor suppressor genes that, as a consequence of the hypermethylation, they become silent. And it's an alternative mechanism to mutation, deletion, to inactivate a tumor suppressor. And I was really believing that, because the literature was very compelling. So we said, but let's see. Let's see what the data said. So we don't start with the hypothesis base. We start with hypothesis free. And we start to study the in the very same samples, you know, sorted tumor samples of this leukemia, the DNA methylome and the transcriptome. And and in in a couple of words, what we found is that the association between DNA methylation levels and transcription levels was very, very low. Yes, for five percent of the genes things these two variables correlate. In general didn't correlate. Why? because perhaps methylation has another role. And methylation, as you can see in this picture, or you can assume, it has a lot to do with memory. Is the, is the writer you know, that you know, writes into the genome what's all the different stages that the cell is going through? It is informative about the cell of origin, it's informative of how much the cells have proliferated in the past, etc. So uh, I will show you why I'm saying this. So, we did an analysis of the methylome of these two types of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the good prognosis and the bad prognosis. And here you will see some of some, some heat maps like this, like this that are very simple to, uh, to, to analyze and to, to understand. Every, in this particular case, every column is one sample from one patient and every row is uh, one CPG site or let's say one gene, the methylation of one, one region. The color code is telling us red, 100% methylation, green, 0% methylation. So you see that when we compare the bad prognosis here in orange with the good prognosis CLLs in, uh, or these leukemias in, 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 in red, there is a lot of changes between the two. But if you put these changes in the context of normal B cells at different maturation stages, what do we find here? Look how striking this is. The worst prognosis CLLs, they have a pattern very similar to the naive cells, naive B cells, and the worse and the, bad, the better prognosis patients with somatic hypermutation in the immunoglobulins have a pattern that is very similar to the memory B cells. So in a way, what we what we saw or what the data was, were telling us is that the majority of the differences in the methylation pattern of these two subtypes of the disease can actually be attributed to a memory of the maturation stage from which they derive, right? So at that time, the majority of the studies of this disease were comparing the disease, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, derived from B lymphocytes, with normal B lymphocytes from blood. And nobody was really sorting the naive and the memory. So therefore, the, the, the previous studies didn't find this, although it's very obvious, because the experimental design did not allow them to find this association with the maturation state of the of the B cells, and this is this is something we learn, and since then we are always considering not only one cell of origin, normal B cell, but we consider all the B cell maturation as potential cells of origin, all the different tumors we analyze with uh, with uh, striking findings. Now, these two groups. Well, if you have a careful look at this, you see that. Although it's very clear, like the two groups, there is some samples here 
that are actually yeah, a bit different and some samples here that actually could be a bit intermediate. So we did a bit more sophisticated bioinformatics or biostatistics with a consensus clustering and actually identified a third group that has an intermediate methylation profile between these two extremes. And this third a new group of the disease actually was correlated with an intermediate prognosis between the two extremes of the worse and the better prognosis. This has been validated uh, using specific biomarkers, uh, both by us in a, in a second study, by a group in, in uh, Christoph Plass group in Heidelberg, the group of Richard Rosenquist uh, in Uppsala and, and now, in, now in Stockholm, the group of Chris Oakes in Columbus, Ohio, the group of John Strefford uh, in Southampton, UK. So this is, is gradually the community's understanding that the, the disease perhaps that epigenetics is useful actually to classify diseases according to the cell of origin signatures. And this is not only for CLL, it holds true also for other visceral malignancies and also for different solid tumors. If you check the literature, you will see that methylation is a great holder of epigenetic memory and is very useful to classify different subentities based on which is the maturation state from which this particular tumor was derived from. The second aspect of memory is not, if the first aspect is cell of origin, the second aspect is, well, how much has this cell proliferated? And why I'm saying this is because there is uh, a, a recent reports that were saying that actually DNA methylation in late replicating regions, so the regions of the genome that are basically silent, uh, it reflects the, it's a mitotic clock. It reflects how much the cells have proliferated because every time the cells divide, in the late replicating regions, there are errors being introduced that are uh, uh, accumulated, right? Uh, so the more the cells divide, the more errors are accumulated and we can measure them. So these changes in methylation has, have no association whatsoever with gene expression. No matter what the methylation is, the genes are silent, it's heterochromatin. But the methylation in these regions where there is no correlation with gene expression are, is, are really relevant, as you will see here. So there's two ways this can happen. There are regions with high CPG content where there is an increase of methylation when the cells divide, and there are regions of long-term heterochromatin where there is a decrease of methylation when the cells proliferate. So we created two clocks, one for hyper, one for hypomethylation, and from those two clocks, we derive one single clock. That I will not explain the details, but it's a clock that is able is a relative measure of the proliferative history of the cells going from zero to one. A stem cell will have a very low proliferative history. A terminally differentiated cell will have a lot of proliferative history. A cancer cell will have even more proliferative history, right? So we apply this to more than 1,500 samples, both considering normal visceral differentiation and different types of visceral malignancies. And it will call your attention that this is an hematopoietic precursor cell, and this is a bone marrow plasma cell. So why, why in the normal B cells, the proliferation is changing so much? Uh, this is not more specific for the tumors. Well, you know, the B cells in their process of maturation, they, there are some stages where the cells proliferate like crazy. And one stage where the cells proliferate a lot is the germinal center B cells. And you see from a naive B cell to a germinal center B cell, there is a big jump. In, the, in this epic mate or proliferation history score. And another thing I would like to highlight is that the plasma cells in the bone marrow, these cells are terminally differentiated, non-proliferative. And if they are, they are non-proliferative, but they have a huge proliferative history. So why? Because they carry in their methylome, in the late replicating regions, they carry the proliferation history of the entire lineage, right? So this is not proliferation status, is proliferation history, which is a different thing. So if we focus on the different diseases, we see there, are, there is heterogeneity from cases with lower and cases with higher proliferative history. Here, there are three subgroups based on cell of origin uh, that I've described. So if we fix the cell of origin, so we take patients from the one group or the intermediate or the other group, we fix the cell of origin and we analyze uh, this the clinical behavior of these particular patients with less or more proliferative history, we can stratify the patients in an amazing way. We can see that the three groups from cell of origin in, in green, in blue, 
and in red can be further stratifi uh, stratified into high proliferation history and then the clinical behavior is worse and low proliferation history where the clinical behavior is better. So what is, the, what is this telling us? It's telling us that by learning from the past, we can predict the future. If the cells have a higher proliferative history in the past, and we study how they, when the patients require treatment and how they behave, this is a good predictor of the future. So in a way, the proliferative history is telling us about the proliferative potential and how the cells biologically will behave. And this is therefore is, is predicting the future. And this is also an, uh, an independent variable from the multivariate uh, uh, statistics perspective. So the third study is related, it will be very short, is related to the integrative analysis of multiple histone modifications and, and epigenetic marks. And this is the analysis, well, you can imagine that if you do nine omic layers, whole genome omic layers from CLL patients, we cannot do a series of 100. The budget was limited to seven in this particular case. So, so we did seven samples and also the normal visual differentiation with all these different layers. And you see the leukemias are always different not only in the methylation, not only in this or the other particular mark, all marks. So again, this story of the, the melody and the different musicians. So it, 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 not only one mark changes, it's everything is changing. Uh, so the melody that the, the cell sells is different from the normals and all the musicians play a different thing. So if we, we can take several of these histone modifications and create a model where we can label the genome in colors and each color reflects one genome function. We can label this in, uh, for instance, in this particular region, gray is a form of heterochromatin, silent. Uh, orange is an active enhancer. Yellow is a, is a weak enhancer. Different shades of green is transcriptional elongation. In red, we have uh, active promoters. And then here we have the, cell, the CLLs and here the normal B cells. And Look, this, uh, this gene is a gene that has been described to be important in the pathogenesis of the disease, but there is no amplification, mutation, translocation. There is no genetic change that justify why this gene is upregulated. Well, you see that next to the gene, there is a region uh, of several uh, uh, dozen KBs. It's a large region that becomes active. And this is what we call a super enhancer or a big regulatory head that we can then analyze uh, other epigenetic marks and we see, okay, it's more open through the attack seek, so more accessible, it loses methylation, but this enhancer itself is not expressed. But the gene is expressed like five times more than in normal B cells. But if we study the 3D genome structure with a technology that is called 4C or the chromos chromosome conformation capture, we can see that if the enhancer is active, there is a loop with the, with the TCF4 gene. And if the enhancer is not active, there is no loop. So this gene is overexpressed in this leukemia through the activation of this enhancer and at the novel loop to the gene, right? And regions like those, that, or like this kind of regions, we find something like 500 in the CLL, a lot of activation in the leukemias, not so much inactivation was far more rare, but the, the, one of the most relevant things was that this 500 regions, if we study specifically the sequences contained within these regions, they were highly enriched for transcription factor binding sites uh, of, of three families of the MFAT, FOX, and TCF left. So then we, we interpret or we believe that this chromatin activation pattern of CLL that is, in spite of the genetic heterogeneity of the disease, is common in all patients, uh, seems to be mediated by the action of few transcription factors that in part are related to through the you know, downstream activity of the B cell receptor or microenvironmental interactions. The, the fourth study, and I'm, I'm, I'm still on time. Yeah. Okay, good. Then uh, it's, it's three slides and, and I'm done. So it is clear, you know, from the one dimension DNA strand that genetic changes, gene expression changes, and even DNA methylation changes are very important in the clinical management, in our understanding of, of hematological malignancies in cancer in general. But the reality is that these two meters of DNA are packed into the cell nucleus, creating a three dimensional uh, uh, structure where overall two major com uh, uh, compartments can be described. The A, more active, more euchromatic, and the B, or inactive, more heterochromatic. Um, and that this is, this is 
not a fixed structure, structural, struct uh, structural feature of the genome. It is a dynamic. It is dynamic. We analyzed uh, normal basal differentiation, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and another type of lymphoid malignancy called mantle cell lymphoma. And we, we did see that the 3D genome structure during normal basal maturation changes, it changes a lot. 28% of the 3D genome interactions measured at the level of these compartments change actually just in the maturation program of one single cell type. That the CLLs and MCLs are more in the cluster of the naive and the memory, which are the suspected cells of origin, and also that the two types of basal tumors have a different 3D genome structures. So in the case of CLL, we took this fraction that is stable in the normal B cells to identify potential 3D genome changes that are leukemia specific. And we did identify roughly 500, uh, no, 350 regions that either go, undergo a, a, a activation, gaining 3D genome interactions in the CLLs or losing them uh, as com in, the, in the leukemias compared to the normal B cells. A, a bit more detailed analysis identified a large region of the genome that was changing from active to inactive compartment in the CLLs, and it contained one gene that is famous in CLL, that is EBF1. It's a gene very important for normal B cell differentiation. It's present in most of the B cell tumors, but in CLL it's silent, and nobody knows why. Uh, you see here the expression in CLL is like flat, and it's very highly expressed in non-CLLs uh, B cells. So this is the 3D genome interactions in the area. The gene is here in the middle, but the whole area is full of interactions between promoters, enhancers, regulatory elements, and in the CLL, all these interactions basically are gone, and the gene becomes heterochromatic. And even we can create a model with this data, we can create a model of the 3D genome structure of the, nu uh, of the EBF1 locus in the nucleus, and then you see that in normal B cells, as compared to CLL, the volume that it occupies within the nucleus is much, much smaller. So basically, for being from being a structure of multiple interactions between regulatory elements and high expression of the gene, to remove uh, all this the activity of the regulatory elements and the whole chromatin becomes packed and then totally silent. So finally, the uh, four take-home messages related to the four studies I've presented. So the first thing, and, and some of them. I, I chose this because some of them can actually be extrapolated to other types of malignancies. So the first one is the issue of the cell of origin and the methylation imprints of the cell of origin. That in the case of CLL, we identify three groups with different clinical behavior. That the, the proliferative history of a cell can be measured by this mitotic clock called EPICMIT, and that it represents an independent prognostic variable predicting the future uh, beha clinical behavior of the patients with CLL. That these cells display a widespread and extensive chromatin activation, uh, and that this seems to be mediated by the action of few transcription factors, which, by the way, could represent important therapeutic targets. Um, and finally, that the CL cells acquire a, an altered 3D genome structure, and these large deregulated three-dimensional blocks actually contain genes related to disease pathogenesis. And finally, the thank you. I mean, here, if I put, if I'm honest, to put the list of collaborators, it's going to be huge amount of people. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, uh, grateful for the multidisciplinary collaboration within the within the DevOps and hospital hospital clinic, hematologists, pathologists, uh, a functionally oriented biologists, bioinformatics, bioinformaticians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And is the combined uh, uh, work of all these layers what actually can give rise to a, to a, a good research. And here is a, is a picture of of my group. There is a couple of people missing uh, in, the, in our last retreat of the program. We organized with Elias in Montserrat, the beautiful mountain here next to Barcelona. If you have the time, that's definitely a place to go. Uh, and the funding agencies, because you can imagine this is not these are not cheap experiments, and we need uh, support and and a lot of gratitude for the funding agencies that believe in in the things we do. And thank you for your attention. So much, Iñaki. Amazing, fascinating stories. Any questions from the audience? Well, many. Uh, Vered? <laughs> this was really amazing. Uh, I was really amazed. And 
Actually, you know, when I when I, I saw the outlayers in the profile and yet then you had boom the answers, the next slide, so that was really <laughs> amazing. I'm wondering your RNA sec, is it like the bulk or did you do it single cell? And do you see heterogeneity the in that? The next presentation <laughs> <laughs> by a not yet Dr. Ramon Massoni will deal oh. exactly about single cell. We've done an amazing lot of work, an incredible amount of work in doing bulk. Mm -hmm. But what we have learned is that, you know, bulk gives you part of it, but it's a blurry picture. Important information, yes. Important messages, yes. Useful for the clinics, yes. But it's a blurry picture. To have a high resolution picture, single cell. And, and, and actually we got an ERC Synergy grant uh, three years ago, uh, together with our friends in the sequencing center, to do these things at the single cell level, single cell epigenome, single cell transcriptomes. And Ramon will talk about the first uh, part mm -hmm. of it, so. Amazing. Perfect. Yeah. Um, really cool talk, <laughs> I really liked it. <laughs> um, like, really. Um, so I'm, a neuro I'm basically a neurologist, and um, these cells are really, t you know, are coming to the stage when it comes to multiple sclerosis and NMO and other inflammatory autoimmune disease. Actually, the newest drugs are really, yeah. you know, working like amazingly well yeah. on both, you know, we have emitting MS, uh, even some type of progressive MS, which is one of the biggest challenges in the field right now. And I wonder, have you tried looking into autoimmunity diseases mm -hmm. with the, with your clock on methylation and all that yeah, stuff? That would be I wish we could do more things, but uh, <laughs> but uh, not in autoimmune diseases ourselves. But there is there are several groups that are focusing on the B cells also in the context of autoimmune diseases and also in the T cells, and there are changes in the in the epigenome as well. Uh, the studies are not so detailed yet, yes, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's going in this direction, and definitely definitely there are changes. There are less than in the context of a neoplastic transformation where there is a huge program in the epigenome that is really a black-white thing. They are more subtle, but they are definitely there, yes. Have yeah. those looked at the difference between the relapsing emitting and progressive MS? Do you know? I no, not at this level. Of, I cannot tell you this level of detail. Right. No. Cool. Sorry. I can, I can give you a couple of references. There is a group here in Barcelona that is Esteban Bayer's staff that is focusing his entire research group on uh, epigenetics of autoimmune diseases. So I can give you a couple of references if you're interested in checking it out. Cool, thanks. Any, maybe one more question if there's any in the audience? No? Okay, good. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. And we are now we have to hear <laughs> the next talk from are Ramon you about Massoni. Cells, Ramon? I hope. Yeah, yeah I hope. Now you promise imagine. he has to. <laughs> <laughs> imagine. Yeah. So he's from the National Center of Genomic Analysis from a team, and he hopefully will show us the continuation, Which is yours? the to be thank continued so story. So good morning, everyone. Shalom. Welcome to our beautiful cities. It's a real pleasure to be talking to all of you today. I'm really excited to see your faces. I'm already a bit tired of Zoom presentation, so this is a, a bit refreshing for me. <laughs> and yeah, as, as Iñaki mentioned, I come from the single cell genomics team. So I hope that today we, we can talk a bit about single cell. And to do that, I will present you this talk, which is titled The Periodic Table of Tonsillar Cells, which, as the name suggests, has a very clearly defined objective, which is to create a single cell-driven taxonomy of cell types and states in a human tonsil in the context of the human cell atlas, a manuscript now in preparation. And why do we care about tonsils? Well, first of all, they are located strategically at the intersection between respiratory and digestive tracts, where they are constantly bombarded by antigens being the first line of defense against many pathogens. Moreover, they are easily accessible through routine tonsillectomies, which makes them a well-rounded model secondary lymphoid organ. As such, they are the meeting place between antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, and antigen-recognizing cells, such as naive T cells and naive B cells. These naive B cells, when they encounter the antigen, they undergo affinity maturation in the, through the germinal center reaction until they become either memory B cells or antibody producing plasma cells, which happens with the help of T follicular helper cells and, fo and follicular dendritic cells. 
So as you can see, having a complete map of all these cells is crucial to understand how adaptive immunity develops. And moreover, since this is a highly mutagenic and proliferative environment, it can help us to map the cell of origin of germinal center derived lymphomas. Now, why do we care about classifying immune cells? Well, let me tell you that, as you might know, specialization is a hallmark of immune cells. And we can exemplify it with these five su subsets of T helper cells, TH1, 217, follicular, and T regulatory cells, which, as you can see, they are regulated by different transcription factors, produce different set of cytokines, and at the end of the day, they will fight different infections. So if we were to group them under a T helper umbrella, we would be missing on so much immunology. That's why we say that the more granular our classification is, the better our understanding. And if we want to, to classify uh, single cells, there's nothing better than through the lenses of single cell genomics, which provides this concept, which is key, which is unprecedented discriminatory power to tell apart and characterize heterogeneity. And here you have a, a paramount example, a paradigmatic, the Thymus Atlas, published in 2020 in Science, in which they characterize previously uncharted cell types in this important lymphoid organ. However, this was done with transcriptomics, and as Iñaki mentioned, the transcriptome is just a snapshot of a cell's identity. And if we want to map the full facets, the, what has been coined as the basis vectors of cell identity, we want to, to have this multimodal approach to have, for example, the, the spatial location. So all the facets that contribute to characterize a cell type. And here we're standing in the shoulders of giants because last year in, in science immunology, there came out two key papers by Hamish King and colleagues in which they characterized for the first time at unprecedented resolution, all the chromatin accessibility and gene expression dynamics in the germinal center reaction. So what we aim to do was to expand on their findings, which were mostly focused on B cells, to have a comprehensive view of this organ of, of tonsils and to include other lineages such as T cells. And to do so, we, we undertook a multimodal approach, as I was mentioning. Here you can see that each column represents a, a patient. We have a total of 10 patients, which cover three age groups, male, uh, kid, young adult, and old adult. We cover both sexes, male and female, and the samples were sampled at two different hospitals, in Pamplona and Barcelona. And then we have a total of five different omics, starting with single cell rna which give, gives us gene expression for each single cell, a toxic to obtain open chromatin profiles, multiom, which is the combination of transcriptome plus open chromatin for each cell, and side seek, in which we have transcriptome plus a panel of 200 protein surface markers. Finally, we also have spatial transcriptomics to map the position of the cell in the tissue. And let me tell you a, an overview, very brief, on, on how we analyze the data. So as you might know, gene expression is, is very redundant and very noisy. There are a lot of genes that, that have a redundancy and to put you an example is, in a way, it would be like measuring the, the height in centimeters and inches for the same person. In, under the hood, they are the same variable. So to remove this redundancy, what the a first step that we do is principal component analysis, in which we group correlated sets of genes into single variables that now are encapsulated in this principal component. This greatly reduces the variability the, sorry, the variability, the dimension of the data set makes the data set more tractable and maximizes the variance. So we have an ordering of the sources of variance in the data set. And these are the coordinates that we use to cluster cells into similar cell types and states. And then we have a second visualization, which we will be using throughout this, this presentation, which is called Yuma. And here the difference is that it's a nonlinear method. So we could view PCA as an optical microscope in which uh, up to a certain point we, we're not able to tell apart two cells. But with UMAP, that's the, its main strength. It tries to keep nearest neighbors together. So if two cells are neighbors in this high dimensional space, once we pull them down to this UMAP dimension, we can tell them apart. So we say that PCA 
maintains global distances very well, but totally messes up local distances, while UMAP keeps local distances together, but global distances are completely meaningless. That's why we never cluster in UMAP space. And with that, we arrive to our Tonsil Atlas, which includes 10 donors, five data modalities, more than 300,000 cells, which group, we group in a total of 137 clusters. The grouping was done using the gene expression from single cell RNA-seq and multium. And then those clusters were transferred to the ATAC-seq and site-seq dataset so that we can characterize each, each cluster using this multimodal approach, using not only RNA, but also protein expression, spatial transcriptomics, and open accessibility. Uh, moreover, we have uh, spatial transcriptomics, which allows us to map the position of the cells in the tissue. Here you can see on the left a spatial-based clustering, which you see in green, the B-cell follicles, where the this germinal center reaction that I was mentioning takes place. And in pinkish, you can see the interfollicular or T-cell zone. This is where T-cells encounter their cognate antigens presented by dendritic cells. Moreover, this is not single cell resolution. So for each pod, we have between one and 10 cells. So we have an algorithm developed by Mark Elosua, a brilliant PhD student in our lab, who is able to decompose, deconvolve and map the proportion of cell types in, in these spots. And you can see, I'm showing you here a germinal center surround, surrounded by these naive T cells. And to give you an example of this unprecedented 